We take our scripture reading from two places, uh, first from Psalm 2. I feel guilty reading Psalm 2 without Psalm 1 because Psalms 1 and 2 are like these big giant doors that open up the Psalter in which you're shown the two ways of life, one only one of which is life, the other is destruction. And then the contest in Psalm 2 and the victory that is assured there. These words, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he'll speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him with those words ringing in our ears, Matthew 27, 27. Matthew 27, 27. Jesus has been tossed about by different rulers. He's finally before Pilate. The crowd chooses to free Barabbas, not Jesus. In fact, they yell, crucify him. They even yell, let the blood of his blood be on us and on our our children. So he has Jesus scourged, these words. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Thus our reading from God's holy word. Uh, It's a human trait to mock, to scorn, to lampoon opponents. Any of you have seen how uh, Abraham Kuyper, who had been prime minister of the Netherlands, uh, a church leader, became a political leader. In fact, I think Josh Dykstra owns a little booklet that has all the cartoons, drawings of Abraham Kuyper and where they lampoon him and make him look foolish and silly or a bully or a tyrant or any number of different things. And that's still common. And then there's blogosphere world, the, the social media world of, of lampooning. There's the Saturday Night Live skit that we all giggle at, well, sometimes. And, but in Jesus' day, there was also a form of scorning that was much rougher and tougher, and they scorn Jesus. They they make Jesus the Son of God, the Lord of glory, Jesus the joke, Jesus the fool, Jesus the nothing, Jesus the nobody, Jesus the liar, Jesus the joke. So we find here mocking unbelief mocks the way, the truth, and the life. That's still true. That hasn't gone away. That isn't a a one-time deal. 
This is still what it will always characterize unbelief in its unbelieving is Jesus, no, not him. The triune God, no, not that one. The covenant God with his promises of life and salvation, of help and hope, the answer, the way, the truth, the life. Uh, not today. I have some oxen I need to check out. I have a game to go to. I have a vacation to take. Uh, thank you, Jesus. No, thank you. Or more harshly, of course not, Jesus. I'm not a fool. Jesus in that church of his. What a joke. And so as we look at Jesus, the joke, mocking Jesus, first we see that he's mocked by a mob, a mocking mob. And I am going to pre-announce my points because they fit. It's all cool. I worked on it. So uh, Jesus, the joke, mocked by a mocking uh, worship. Jesus, the joke, led off to more mockery and crucifixion. And it's a four-pointer, Jesus, the judge, our Savior, the Lord of blessing, or the one who mocks, mocking, unbelief. Now, it's important you get that these soldiers, what I'm not going to do in this sermon is Look how bad a Roman scourging was. and it went, Watch the movie if you want to see that. I'm not interested in doing that. And I don't really recommend the movie. It's Roman Catholic theology, as a side note. And Jesus could only suffer in a physical kind of way. So he had to suffer in a maximally physical kind of way, according to Roman Catholic theology. But sidebar finished. Now... <laughs> To a people, a covenant people, a rejecting the Messiah covenant people, who would say, yes, let this man's blood be on our heads and on our children, so confident he's a joke, he's not the way, the truth, the, the life, the answer, so confident Barabbas has more life to give than Jesus. Jesus is turned over to this battalion of soldiers. Now, I grew up working in the construction business, so I know all about spitting and cussing and guys being together and men at their worst, mean men at their worst, and now soldiers at their worst. And we're always, it's easier to be at our worst in a mob, in a gang, with others alongside encouraging us. It's easier to be more violent, and so they uh, practice this mockery of Jesus to diminish him, to humiliate him. They flog him, and that has its own horrors. But thereupon, next, let's mock him. And you know what happens. They strip him, and they begown him, and uh, they twist these, this crown of corn, the thorns upon him. But before we get to that, really, is we see unbelief in its arrogance, in its folly, in its stupidity. I mean, here is the answer. Here is the hope. Here are young men playing soldier, eventually will be old men suffering disease. Here are men confident in their, their macho and strength and, and ability to inflict horror and terror. But one day, they'll also be... Uh, eaten up with uh, guilt, or they'll have a wife that loses them, or children whose lives go haywire, and, and they're in misery. In other words, every human being finally finds themselves, where's the way, where's the truth, where's the light, where's the answer? Well, right in front of you. The one you're going to pin up on some posts, like a paper doll and mock some more. But this is the way of unbelief. These soldiers are in miniature what all unbelief is. Jesus, yes or no? Well, well, no, and then expletive, no. Uh, Jesus, Lord or liar? <laughs> Not even liar or lunatic, a joke, a fool, a clown. So this mob of arrogance 
takes its unbelief out on him confidently, resolutely. And this isn't any different than the unbelief you find on the internet. It's no different than the famed four horsemen of atheism today and their belligerence and confidence and many others like them. Indeed, some modern Christians, or not Christians, but raised in the church, find themselves hearing this kind of mockery and, and some veiled arguments that goes along with it. And they're convinced Jesus is a joke, isn't he? No more Jesus. Don't need him. Well, from this arrogant mocking of this mob comes the mocking worship. You claim to be king. A king should be honored. Hail the king. And so they begown him and they make this thorn of uh, this crown of thorns careful, you know. I don't want to draw my own blood. He, a, a king needs a scepter, so they give him this reed stick and they bow before him and make a fool of him. How silly, how weak Jesus is. We have these macho soldiers, these tough, hardened types, and they say absolutely no to Jesus. And they would tell us no. The Jews said no to Jesus. He wasn't the Jesus they wanted. They wanted a, a warrior Jesus, a military Jesus, a, a King David fighter Jesus. They wanted a guy on a white steed leading the way he wanted him they wanted him to wield some of those miracles to produce food or make blind men see to you know make oceans split and mountains fall on armies they wanted liberation they wanted what modern dispensationalists want <laughs> just had to throw a dart i couldn't help it um, <laughs> Since it's, I wouldn't say that in a regular sermon, but in seminary, you know. <laughs> they want what all sorts of modern American fundamentalists want. Give us back a Jesus who wields a sword, who beats up people, shows who's boss, we're on top, na 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 na. That's what they want, but that's not the way or the truth and the life or not yet. They are given the great gift of King Jesus, and they turn aside. No, thank you. The church has its own way of a health and wealth Jesus instead of a Jesus on a cross, a moral exemplar Jesus instead of a humiliated a Jesus made a joke. We have our own ways of wanting to distance ourselves from the mockery and the shame and the humiliation we, let's admit it as a middle-class church, want to live very comfortable, very comfortable lives. We want American dream lives in which the cost isn't very costly. And, you know, we just pretend that we don't think like that, but we do. We really don't like this Jesus who's mocked. Let's get past that. They do their best, and then finally they kind of set their jaw, and the soldiers next stop laughing. And now it's time to lead him to his death. We have the power. Ours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, or at least the Caesar we serve. We know who's Lord of this world, and certainly not this joke of a Jew. It's not him. There's a strange irony what happens, right, when Pilate puts that posting up above the cross, Jesus, the King of the Jews. No, 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 he claimed, he claimed to be a King of the Jews. What I have written, I have written, you know, you're trying to poke the eye in Jesus. You hate him, you hate us, we hate you. This is your Jesus, this is your Jew, Jesus, King of the Jews on a cross, a failure, a flunk, defeated, a joke. Unbelief is always confident of itself. 
until there's a reckoning, until it's not. Unbelievers still mock Jesus, still mock those who mock Jesus, still would have him crossed up and crucified, or tidily tucked away out of the way so he makes no difference, no one notices. They spit on him, they beat him with a cane, they beat him up some more, they show him who is boss, so to speak, they assert their superiority with great cruelty, and through it all, Jesus is silent. He doesn't answer back. Through it, he lays down his life for his sheep. Through it, he offers himself and goes to the cross. Through it, he exercises his kingship, his royalty, as the one whose life will not be taken from him, but whose life is offered up to give us life. Through it, his royalty is made manifest in his silence, in his resolve. He's not a squealing clown trying to make deals. He's not one pleading for a way out. He's not one who acts like the big joke, who would somehow save himself. After all, he saved others. None of that. He's the one who has full control. And so they resolve finally to bring him to the cross in more mockery, more cruelty. This Jesus is finally crucified and conquered. And of course, you know what happens while he's on the cross, right? As the narrative follows in Matthew, this is Jesus, King of the Jews, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Chief priests, scribes, elders, all the clergy get in on it too. They mock him. He saved others. He can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Ha, ha. Let him come down from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And even the robbers were crucified with him, reviled him. More mockery, more unbelief, more the corporate business world we see that walks in the confidence of its wealth and doesn't have any room for Jesus or church or covenant promises, or blood shed for them. Uh, all the boardrooms, all the locker rooms, all the faculty lounges of the world of unbelief that's all sprinkled about everywhere in the world and in our own land, Jesus is a joke. Let off, crucified, and then we can laugh and laugh at the story that he was raised from the dead. More laughing, or if not outright derision, then a kind of cold, distant, just not now, not for me today, not Jesus the way, the truth, the life, or Jesus the joke. Well, I side with the jokers. You know, I have a vacation to take, I have a house to build, I, I have exams to take, I have a career to build, I have a girl to flirt with, whatever it is across the board. No thank you, Jesus. The joke. But all of this this whole narrative and everything that happens is under the big shadow of Psalm 2. The big contest of kingdoms never goes away. Jesus, the judge, is also here and will one day return in the flesh and make it so. That's why we read from uh, Psalm 2 there, because that's, mock, that's the mockery of unbelief right at the front head of the pages of the Psalter. The nations rage. It's an outrage, this God and his Christ. They plot in vain. They plot indeed. 
but will their plot succeed? See? The kings set themselves, rulers counseled together against the Lord, Yahweh, and against his anointed. Against Jesus Christ in Matthew 27. They still plot. They still rage in vain. And who's laughing now? The one who sits in the heavens laughs. laughs. You know, as a new doctrine of God class, sometimes we, ha- we meet a giggling God in the Bible. And right here we meet him. <laughs> He's laughing at these little creatures of clay trying to duke it out with him. I mean, it's just like, this is just really funny. <laughs> It's like Americans playing Canadians in hockey sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is silly. And he'll speak to them. He holds them in derision. Let's get, let's get the tables all put set right. He'll speak to them in his wrath, terrify them in his fury. As for me, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. He set him first on Golgotha, but finally in triumph. That's the way of things. That's the way, the truth, the life. And then the son speaks. The Lord said to me, you're my son today. I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage. Us. In the church everywhere. The ends of the earth, your possession. You'll break them. They would break him with a reed and conk him on the head and mock him and make a fool of him, a Jesus the joke, but he shall break with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. That's the end of things. And now a word for the world of unbelief for unbelief in the church, for unbelief in your own heart, the rebellions that well up and you hide and pet like little little puppies in your own heart. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. So Google and (laughs) notice I didn't say presidents, but you can add them. But in our world, it's economic kings that seem to be real kings. Google and Amazon and Apple and just pick all the corporate world. Be warned, you big shots. Hollywood big wigs, producers, directors, actors, actresses. Be warned, big shot athletes. Be warned, academic heroes. Be warned, ministers who put on pedestals. Be warned, each and every one of us. Be warned. Be warned. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. But his love is quickly kindled too. He so loved the world that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Not perish in the way that have everlasting life. Kiss the Son. Bow in homage. Ask for help. Look for salvation. After all, blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Shall we pray? Lord, teach us to see that Christ's suffering, even mockery, is unto victory. The shame He endures exposes unbelief in its folly and the victory that is his triumph and the resurrection and his return is our happiness and eternal joy. May we not be ashamed of him as he was not ashamed of us. May we walk with him, the one who's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen.